Welcome to a new episode of the Tolkien Experience Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown. I'm Luke Shelton. And I'm Sarah Westwick. Each episode, we share with you an interview of a Tolkien scholar or fan. That's right. In these interviews, one of us asks our guest to respond to six questions that help us learn about their personal Tolkien experience. All of this is made possible by our supporters on Patreon, so we want to thank them and encourage you to check out the community at patreon.com slash Tolkien experience. We are so excited to share this podcast with you. So without any more delay, let me introduce our guest. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Tolkien Experience podcast. And here today I have with me a fabulous and wonderful friend of mine, Dr. Christine Larson. Tolkienian astronomer and mother of bunnies. I'll explain another time. Dr. Christine Larson is Professor of Astronomy at Central Connecticut State University, which is conveniently located halfway between Boston and New York City, not that she visits either of them very often. Her research and teaching focus on the frequently uncomfortable intersections between science and society, including the often overlooked history of women in science, misconceptions, conspiracy theories, and pseudosciences, the popularization of science for general audiences, and the uses and misuses of science in popular culture, including zombie films, science fiction TV series, and the fiction of Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Andrzej Sapkowski, George R. R. Martin, and Neil Gaiman. Her most recent book is called Particle Panic, How Popular Media Popularize Science Feed Public Fears of Particle Accelerator Experiments. And I just about got my mouth around that entire title. She is currently completing a book on a project on science and magic in Andrzej Sapkowski's The Witcher series. But she's also been inflicting her obsession concerning the astronomy of Middle Earth on various people, including me, since the early 2000s in numerous book chapters, journal articles, and conference presentations. Her paper, Deconstructing Durin's Day, Science, Scientific Fan Fiction, and the Fan Scholar, received the Tolkien Society's Best Paper Award in 2020. And with Janet Brennan-Croft, she co-edited a special issue of the Journal of Tolkien Research on Tolkien and the works of Joss Whedon. Christine, welcome to the Tolkien Experience podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Sarah. I'm really pleased to have you. And I can't go one bit further without mentioning not so much the elephant in the room as the Elrond in the room. That is gorgeous. Uh, you can tell who my favorite character in Tolkien is, obviously. <laughs> clearly, clearly. Yes. Uh, well, one of the questions is going to be about your favorite parts of Tolkien. So maybe we'll get on to Elrond and his feather boa at that point. What do you say? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Excellent. So tell me, Christine, when were you first introduced to Tolkien's work? When and how? Well, I don't really remember the how. Um, I've always been sort of a nerd. You know, like many, many children, I was a dinosaur fanatic when I was a little kid. My earliest memory is sitting in my mother's dilapidated blue station wagon, clutching a package of plastic dinosaurs that we had bought that I couldn't open until we got home from the Bronx Zoo, which was a 90-mile ride. And you know what the attention span of three-year-olds is, which is why it's seared into my memory. I'm sure. Uh, yes. At some point, I, I sort of went from uh, dinosaurs to astronomers astronomy to theoretical physics and astrophysics and cosmology. And somewhere in the mid to late, it was before the Bakshi movie mm -hmm. and before the Rankin Bass, because I was into Tolkien by then. And I still have my program from the movie theater from the Ralph Bakshi movie. Oh, wow. So, so it would have been, I'm probably around 76, 77. So I would have been about 13, 14 years old. Um, I, I still have my Ballantine paperback boxed set with the gold foil on it. And uh, yeah, I, I had my hand drawn map of Middle Earth on my bedroom wall, mm -hmm. which if you've ever seen me try to draw anything, my students <laughs> can say it's a miracle that you could actually identify it as Middle Earth. I was actually pr pretty proud of that. Uh, and I was one of those people who, you know, devoured it, read it repeatedly and, and read it religiously every summer through college and probably 
a little differently from a lot of people who read Tolkien. I mean, everybody who reads Tolkien gloms onto something, whatever, whatever speaks to them. From the very beginning in reading Tolkien, I was making notes of all the astronomical mentionings. I mean, how many people when they're reading Tolkien for the first or second or third time are writing down, oh, he mentioned the phase of the moon. Write it down. Uh, a number of years ago, I was looking through some stuff, and I'm a pack rat, and I found my notebook of Tolkien astronomical mentions back from when I was in high school. Wow. So I've sort of been doing this for, for a long time, although I am incredibly ashamed to admit that I didn't make it through the Silmarillion the first two times through. Oh, which is my like one of my favorite things of Tolkien. Now I got as far as as Baron and Luthien, and I think the romance part just turned me off. To be honest with you, <laughs> so there was no astronomy. Oh, now I know there is astronomy in there, but at the time it was like, oh, romance, no. <laughs> so the astronomy is not quite as obvious in the Silmarillion as it is in Lord of the Rings. Well, in the beginning part, it is because the beginning, you know, in the beginning, in the literally in the Ainu sure. Lindale, it, it's like all cosmology. And so you have the origin of the universe and the origin of the sun and the moon and the two trees and all this wonderful stuff. And then they get to Middle Earth chasing those stupid family jewels of Feanor. <laughs> Maybe I didn't quite say that right, but I'm you not, get the idea. Sure that's exactly what. I, I, well, we don't have a feather boa over here on Elrond, so maybe it is the family. No, that would be a slash story. Sorry, sorry. Um, but you know, at some point, it gets less of the cosmological and more of just the tragedy, the, just the absolute abject. Feanor, you screwed up. You have doomed your family, your elven kind, and a lot of other innocent people. And then all of a sudden you get back to, you know, Arendelle and the morning and evening star and mm. all that fun stuff. So it's sort of this wave of, of things where you find the astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yeah, the Baron Luthien part, I, I sort of lost it in there. But now mm. I know that if you read that carefully, there's actually astronomy in there as well, because Baron sings a, a song, you know, in honor of the Big Dipper, of the, the, the Valakirka, the... the um, the sign that Varda puts in the heavens that Morgoth is eventually going to get his butt kicked. <laughs> so, you know, but you, you don't quite notice that the first couple of times you're reading through when you're 15 years old, I guess. Mm. I, gu I guess you need a PhD, but, you know. Maybe, maybe. But also, I don't think many people out there would say that when they're reading through Tolkien's work, that's the bits that they really focus on. Um, because it's kind of blended into the whole of the landscape, isn't it? That's the, you know, in my next life, I want to be one tenth as smart as Tolkien was. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really is a Renaissance man for the 20th century. He was brilliant. He was a great writer. He was interested in everything. The man was a sponge. He knew about flowers. He knew about the weather. He knew about philology, m mythology, you know, lots of ologies. And he blended it all together in this incredible secondary world. And, you know, in On Fairy Stories, he's telling people, if you want to be a true sub-creator, you have to make sure that people can immerse themselves in this world to such a degree that, yes, a little bit of them knows it's not real, but while you're reading it, it seems so real. Mm -hmm. And he gives us that experience. He, he is the consummate teacher. He gives us in the lecture on fairy stories what to do, and then he shows us how to do it mm -hmm. with his own work. Mm -hmm. So that's my idea of, of a great teacher who doesn't just know the theory, but can actually show you, can lead you by example through it. Mm -hmm. And and that's why it seems so natural that, oh, yeah, you can read about things. And, you know, that almost sounds like plate tectonics. Well, yeah, there's a little bit. He, he wove everything so mm -hmm. seamlessly in there. Mm. It's one of the many, many, many magical things about reading Tolkien, isn't it? That there's so many layers that you could actually look at and pull out for yourself as being, well, this is my little area that I really like, and it's all buried in there. 
Yeah, that's it's you know one of the things that I, I I love being a professor. Oh, I've got like the greatest job in the world. And academia has a lot of great things. I mean, they pay us to do this. I mean, this is like really amazing. But don't tell everybody. Shh, shh. But one of the things I don't like about academia is that everybody is so specialized, and everybody's in their own little little, little peg hole, their own little silo, mm-hmm. and they don't care about all the other stuff. And what Tolkien is showing us is that that is the wrong way to approach it. If you really want to understand Tolkien the way that he sort of wanted us to appreciate it, you would realize that he is blending all of this together, that he wants us to see these other aspects and how they fit together, which is why Tolkien studies is the preeminent interdisciplinary studies as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Because in order for us to, because we're not each in the individual one as brilliant as Tolkien, we need all of us together to pool our resources and pool our talents so that, you know, somebody can tell us about the Beowulf influences Mm -hmm. and somebody can tell us about the botanical influences. And I'll give you my little obsession. And, And between all of us, we can really appreciate the depth of what is there. Yeah, I, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the Tolkien that has given to you um, all of that astronomy that you're finding within the text is the same person who's given us all of the languages uh, and the linguistic rabbit holes to go disappearing down into. And I know that people I've talked to have been absolutely mesmerized by his map work um, and the sheer knowledge and understanding of geography and how a world actually works. Uh, is is astonishing. And then, as you say, flora and fauna, culture and history, it's all in there. It's absolutely incredible. Take one element of that out and you would certainly feel like that world is not quite what you want it to be. But because he could put everything in there. And you're right, the kind of community that we have around Tolkien provides us with all of those things. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we're just really blessed to be able. And plus, it, we, we meet all these wonderful people and make these great friendships and have meetings. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. The, we the meetings. absolutely do. Yes. And those yes. are beyond splendid. Yes, they are. Yeah. So let's continue talking about um, cosmology and astronomy and Tolkien, actually, because I've got a question for you. Tolkien, as you say, an incredibly clever man who knows a lot. Does he always get his astronomy right? He gets it right a lot more often than he gets it wrong. That's pretty amazing. Which is pretty amazing. Uh, uh, And some of the times when he gets it wrong, you really have to understand that it's, it's a plot. It's necessary to the plot. Mm -hmm. That this is where you have to put aside your disbelief. My prime example is um, in the Akalabeth, when, you know, we've overthrown Melkor and many of the elves have gone back to the Blessed Lands and Elrond and Elros have made their decisions and, you know, Elrond is going to be the Lord of Rivendell as an elf and Elros is going to be the king of Numenor. What's Numenor, you ask? It's a star-shaped island, which has been prepared by, by, uh, by the Valar. And how are you going to know to sail to Numenor? Well, you have to have a guide to, to, to sail by. You have to have a star to sail by. So Eärendil, Elros's dad, probably the only time he's actually a good father. <laughs> actually, don't get me started on that. <laughs> he actually positions himself in the West over the island so that the the, the soon-to-be Numenorians can sail West and know where the island is. And so the astronomy there is ghastly. Having the evening star visible all night long in the Western sky is completely astronomically wrong. But it's so fitting in the story Mm -hmm. that you have to just say, you know, I'm going to give this mulligan to the professor because I understand what he's doing. Mm -hmm. The times when he gets it wrong, where you're like, oh, seriously, Ronald, is mostly with his phases of the moon. Uh And he knew he blew that. He blew it so badly in The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. 
which is such a shame because the moon plays such a central role mm. in The Hobbit with the whole thing about Durin's day and the moonlight, you know, the, the last little bit of sunlight, you know, shining on the keyhole. And so to get it wrong was embarrassing and he knew it. And he tried to go back and fix it. And if you go and read John Ratliff's The History of the Hobbit, he leads you through some of the, the, the errors that Tolkien made. And he, he had messed up the chronology so much that he could never fix it. So when he wrote The Lord of the Rings, he actually used a real world calendar so that he would get it right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Christopher Tolkien in the History of Middle Earth volumes relating to the Lord of the Rings, he shows how his father had little cheat sheets and laid out what the phases of the moon would be. And so he got the phases of the moon almost right in the Lord of the Rings. I found one real boo-boo right before they go into Moria. But other than other than that, they're a whole lot better than they are in The Hobbit. But that is an extraordinary level of detail. It is. And, and you know, today we would say that Tolkien was uh, suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder, I think, because he just wanted to get it perfect. And he would tell you that he wasn't suffering at all. He was actually enjoying it. Mm -hmm. this, this, was, this was what he thought you needed. You need this level of detail. And uh, it, uh, in the letters between um, father and son. Uh, Tolkien is talking to Christopher about how it's going, writing The Lord of the Rings. And he, he makes a comment about, uh, uh, I need to know how much earlier the moon rises each or rises or sets each night and how to stew a rabbit. And so you could tell where he is in the story by that comment, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, and then he says that later that he had found some horrible mix up where, because remember in The Fellowship, with the fellowship, they break off and they go and do their own thing. And so Tolkien has to somehow keep in his mind straight what each group of, of people is doing at the exact same moment. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously, he has to make sure that the reader knows that these events are happening simultaneously in different parts of Middle Earth. And so the way that he does that is by describing what the phase of the moon is. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Lord of the Rings, in many of the chapters, he mentions what the phase of the moon is. And you're like, yeah, and that's a cue for the reader to know, oh, if Pippin sees a full moon and Frodo is seeing a full moon, they're seeing the same full moon. So those events must be happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that was the part that Tolkien really, really wanted to get right, mm -hmm. not only for his own mind, but to help the reader as well. I wonder how many of our listeners actually are aware of, of the way in which that plays such a part. But I mean, if they weren't, they are now. So that's another reason to reread The Lord of the Rings and to look for that. So that's absolutely fantastic. So uh, next question then is, what is your favourite part of Tolkien's work? If you had to pick a bit, a chapter, a character, a story, a moment, what would it be? <laughs> the Elrond in the room. Why? Uh, he he's always been he's always been my favorite character. He's I mean, you know, everybody goes, "Oh, Luthien and Baron, that's just so tragic and yada yada, so tragic." What about Elrond? <laughs> what about Elrond? I mean, he loses, well, we don't he loses his wife whatever about her, but he loses his <laughs> beloved daughter, right? He, she marries some schmuck who's going to be king of Gondor or some Middle Earth, whatever, you know. <laughs> he lo he loses 1,600 years he's with Gilgalad and who ends up dying horribly in front of his mm -hmm. eyes on, you know, Mount Doom. He, he sees every, every – he lost his parents at a young age – Everything about Elrond's life is just tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. He sees the he lives long enough to see everything turn to dust, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really shows us the problem with immortality. Yes, I know the elves aren't aren't immortal. They only live as long as the world lives. But over thousands of years to lose basically your entire family, to lose, to see kingdoms go to dust, to see innocent people die horribly and not so innocent people thrive. It's just, it's amazing that he's still like is sane by, by the third age, as far as I'm concerned. 
Mm -hmm. So he's, he's, yeah. I mean, the only one he's got left at that point is, as you say, Arwen, who then doesn't sail into the West with him and his mother-in-law. That's a good, who goes with him. So he can't get away from his mother-in-law. Talk talk about living up to your mother-in-law. Oh, man. (laughs) You know, and he's got these twin sons who like, they have names, but not really personalities. I mean, you know, and we don't even know what happens to them. So mm-hmm. does he ever see them again after mm-hmm. he goes west? It's, you know, loses his brother who becomes king of, of Numenor. It's just one thing after another. There's a line somewhere that I'm paraphrasing badly that for Elrond, all all choices end in sorrow. Mm-hmm. Because he can't win. He's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. No matter what happens, there's going to be sorrow. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, he's a lore master. He's smart. He likes books. He's a healer. He's, he's sort of a, a polymath. Um, there's a, a book chapter that I wrote that hopefully if my friends ever get their collection of essays published, um, I actually argue that of all the characters, I think the most autobiographical is Elrond in many ways. Hmm. I've I've got to say, I have never thought of it that way. I mean, I know that Tolkien wrote that he saw himself in Faramir, um, but that is a really interesting perspective that I'd never thought of before. So Elrond, you see Tolkien in Elrond. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he was fostered right? By the, mm-hmm. by the sons of Feanor. He, you know, lost his parents. He had a brother who was very close in age to him. Um, and just as Elrond had to choose his kind, so too did Tolkien. Mm-hmm. And choosing to be a Catholic in England at that time was a momentous choice. Mm-hmm. And Ed, like Elrond, chose the same as his mother. Remember, it was Elwing. It wasn't Eärendil who said, we're going to be elves. It's <laughs> like, go ahead, honey. And then Elwing's like, elf. And Eärendil's like, crap, I wanted to be human. And then, <laughs> you know, later on, Elrond's like, elf, please. And Elros is like, human. And and so just as Elwing's decision in a sense, had repercussions for her sons. Similarly, we see that with Tolkien. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and, and being a lore master and all these other things, it's, it's, I see, I mean, it's not obviously a one-to-one course. It's not an allegory because Tolkien hated allegory, but I think that there's enough of it that you can see, I like to think of it as echoes. You hear echoes, mm-hmm. reverberations of these aspects of his life in, in Elrond, so... That's absolutely fascinating. Well, there'll be another one of your essays to look forward to reading. (sighs) Yes. Eventually, (laughs) Eventually, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to ask you was, that's about your favourite bit of Tolkien's actual writing. But have you had a favourite experience that is to do with Tolkien in some way? So um, a favourite reading experience, a favourite... conference or something about working with Tolkien that is favorite for you? You know the answer to that question, Sarah. Is it, is it Leeds? You you know, you know the question. You know the answer. Yes, the meetings. <sighs> I think we have to explain what we mean by the meetings. Uh, I'm trying to say this without crying, but thank you, Professor, for giving me the most wonderful friends in the whole world. And to be able to go around the world and to meet people who are just as enthusiastic about Tolkien and knowledgeable and can educate you in ways of looking at Tolkien that you'd never thought of before. It's, it's a gift. It really is. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, you know, the thought of going to medieval conferences for me, it was like, why would I go to a medieval conference? I'm trained in general relativity, right? But going to these medieval conferences and giving papers on Tolkien, medievalists would come up to me, usually with a glass of wine in my hand and a glass of wine in their hands, and ask me what I was doing. Not what I was doing at that moment. I was drinking. But, you know, <laughs> why, I was at the, why I was at the conference. And I would explain that I'm just sort of like a lost astronomer who does Tolkien. And they're like, oh, do you know about astrolabes? And I'd be like, uh, 
no, but I could learn. And at some point after that, I learned about astrolabes and started doing astrolabe workshops at medieval conferences. So I went to the conferences because of Tolkien, you know, come for the come for the Tolkien, leave with homework to learn how to do astrolabes. So now I have another sort of scholarly out, you know, output where I go to medieval conferences and I teach people how to not be afraid of science and math and actually do calculations with astrolabes. Mm-hmm. And, and that's another that's another gift that Tolkien has given me. So uh, Tolkien, the gift that keeps on giving. Well, I have to yeah. concur with this astrolabe thing because I am, let's just put it nicely, not great with mathematics. Okay. Uh, it tends to send me screaming in the opposite direction, flailing limbs and all. This woman right here had me astrolabe in hand, actually doing calculations and enjoying it. And I never See, thought I'd scary. say that. I never thought I'd say that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, but uh, the two big medieval conferences, there's one at Kalamazoo at Western Michigan and the others at the University of Leeds. And that's where Sarah and I would hang out at the marquee on the couches and have meetings, which would entail drinking local mead mm-hmm. and, and then, and then buying jewelry. Yes. Cause, cause there were the lovely people who make handmade jewelry there. So we would have, you know, locally crafted mead. We'd buy locally crafted jewelry, buy some used books. Sit around and talk Tolkien. Sit around and talk Tolkien. Damn you, COVID. Yes, I know. Because it's robbed us of that experience for way too many years. But yes, next. 22. Next 22. Yes, absolutely. 22. Yeah. Uh, and I think you're right about the way in which we have a community around Tolkien. And of course, lots of different people with their different experiences with Tolkien form their own kinds of communities. You and I are part of a a really quite academic community. Not that we don't have fun because academics can have fun too. We have lots of fun. Uh, One day I might tell the story about the helium balloons. Um, oh boy, no, or not, or not, no, or not, or not. Um, you, you mean the imagine? Mean the imaginary the helium imaginary balloons? Imaginary helium balloons. The imaginary helium yes, balloons. Yes, I'm just yes. going to leave that to everybody's imagination. But I can be bribed with mead to tell the story. Um, but we have that community, and that community is a, a joy. It's an absolute joy because we're all from different backgrounds uh, and from different places and we all love Tolkien and we bring our own experiences to it and then we sit around tables and we drink and we know things. And yeah, it's absolutely we marvelous. De- mm. we, we definitely drink. And I think I might have that on a on a cup that I have in my office that I drink and I know things. You but, drink and you know things. But, but uh, there is no course, meat in there. There's no meat in there. <laughs> alas, so. alas. Uh, alas. And of course, there are, there are people uh, listening or watching the podcast who will have um, – similar sorts of experiences, but, you know, in different ways. People who are members of the Tolkien Society and like to come along to various things and just be with people. Those who've never been to a Tolkien Society thing but have friends that they like to talk about Tolkien with, sometimes online friends. Um, So, you know, the community that Tolkien brings is priceless. It's absolutely priceless. So I, I completely agree with you with that being a favorite sort of experience, if you like. So you are an academic in an area that is not focused on Tolkien, although you've brought that to your Tolkien, if you like. Um, but you've been you know, working with Tolkien stuff for quite some time now. Has the way in which you've approached Tolkien's writing changed over time? Have you noticed your approaches differing? I don't know that my approach has changed, but my appreciation and my knowledge has certainly grown. And again, not just, you know, I started with like as a one trick pony. It was like Tolkien and astronomy. Okay. And then I did some stuff on Tolkien and geology. Then I did some stuff on Tolkien and women. Mm -hmm. And I've just literally like this weekend finished this ginormous paper on Tolkien and Indo-European mythology of divine twins. 
And if you had told me that I would be writing stuff like this, you know, 50, 20 years ago, I would have said you were crazy. <laughs> uh, so, so I have educated myself. I have seen things in Tolkien that pique my curiosity. And I'm like, I'm not an expert in that, but I know where I can find information. And mm -hmm. I know people who are experts and they can read my crazy writings and say if I'm completely off track. And so, again, it's this whole idea that we don't have to stay in our little silo. You know, Tolkien was a philologist by rights, he, language, his thing was language. But there's so much more to Middle Earth than language. And so mm -hmm. we should be more like the professor, that we should be learning about these different areas and pushing ourselves. And, you know, sometimes we'll get it wrong and somebody nice will tell us that, you know, your argument really doesn't make sense or, you know, somebody else wrote this five years ago <laughs> and, you know, but, <laughs> but, but, but the Tolkien community is really, really generous with their knowledge and their time. And I, there's never been a time where I've had a question where an honest question and someone hasn't given me an answer. And, and when I'm barking up the wrong tree, they're like, no. <laughs> okay. 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 So you've obviously been reading Tolkien for a long, long time. Um, if you were to recommend Tolkien's work, how would you persuade somebody that Tolkien's work is worth reading? I would probably just start reading some of it to them. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm, yes, I'm one of those people when they read of the Lord of the Rings, I skip the poems, most of the poems. Ack. I know I, I don't, but, but, a lot of his other poetry is really brilliant. So maybe reading from the Lays of Beleriand or um, the, the Fall of Arthur. The Fall of Arthur is great. Read that aloud sometime. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's really great stuff. So I think it would depend on what that person was interested in. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times they go, oh, you know, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, that silly fantasy stuff, tra-la-la, elves down in the valley. That, no, that's not. You know, I pick something, find out what they're interested in, and you know that there's something that uh, that Tolkien relates to that, and then read that to them, mm -hmm. or, or maybe even you know sometimes just reading the letters mm -hmm. are fascinating. There's amazing stuff in his letters, and and he's written stuff that has nothing to do with Middle Earth. I mean, I have my pile of books because I'm writing various things here, and somewhere I had my copy of Roverandom. I had ah ah Roverandom, okay. Nothing to do with Middle Earth. Kids book illustrated by, you know, he, he has his own illustrations, which is another amazing thing about him. Mm -hmm. You know, a story about a toy dog who becomes a real dog and gets into real mischief. I mean, it's, it's a cute little story. Not what you would expect. It's not the Lord of the Rings. So there are things that he wrote that are very different from what we sort of have this idea of what, what Tolkien is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. Well, Christine, it has been an absolute delight to talk to you today. And thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge of Tolkien with us uh, and the way in which you have interacted with Tolkien over the years. It's been really lovely to hear your, your experience with Tolkien. And it's been really great to see you, Sarah. And I look forward to our next meeting in person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, it cannot come too soon. I'll I tell. know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you ever so much, Christine. Bye. Bye, everyone. We are so thankful that we have such gracious scholars and fans who want to share the Tolkien experience with us and with you. We really enjoy making these podcasts, and the fun doesn't stop here. That's right. It continues on social media. You can find us on Facebook as Tolkien Experience and Twitter as at Tolkien EXP. Don't forget to like, follow, share and comment because we love interacting with you just as much as we enjoy talking to our guests. 
for even more content and to join our fellowship of supporters, check out our Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Tolkien Experience. Finally, you can also follow our personal Twitter accounts. I'm at Luke B. Shelton. I'm at S.R. Westwick. And I'm at Aaron L. Palmerdale. If you have questions or comments, you can send them to us by email at tolkienexperience at gmail.com. If you want to know more about this week's guest, we provide show notes at tolkienexperience.com. You can find the podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple, Stitcher, and YouTube. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and we truly hope that, in a way, it contributes to your own Tolkien experience.